Welcome everyone and a very special welcome to the Three Chopped Elementary joining us for the first 45 minutes of our drive today. My name is Ali and on camera with me today is Senzo and we are coming live to you all the way from the Greater Kruger National Park in South Africa. Now we were looking at some wildebeest as you saw earlier on which are also known as GNU but I think we can also start calling them ghosts because they have pretty much disappeared, vanished into the bush. We cannot see not even one of them anymore. Look at that. <laughs> They have all gone away. I think they have actually crossed this little dip over here looking for something else to eat on the other side, but that just gives you an idea of how hard it is to sometimes find some of the animals around here. If you have any questions about those, um, the animals that we're looking, or not looking, but possibly looking to find, please feel free to send them through uh, via your teacher. Now, I am still a bit puzzled as to where all of these animals have gone. But I think maybe our best bet is to actually try and go around and see if maybe they come onto the other road. Because the direction where they were heading, there's another road cutting across. So I think we're going to try and reverse, suck the vehicle around, and then go see if maybe we can see them again. Because, um, yeah, they have turned into ghosts and we can't really see them anymore. Who would have thought? One of the biggest antelope that we get here in South Africa, pretty much vanished. Eaten by all the bushes. Hmm. All right, let's see if I can reverse here. Luckily, our cars are quite small, so it shouldn't be that hard to try and get onto the other side. No big trees behind me that I can crash into. Definitely don't want to do that. Just on the start of the drive. And off we go. Ooh, I see another animal all the way from here. And it's perhaps one of my favorite ones because it's very pretty. Ah, look at that. Exactly where the wildebeest were, now we have one of the most famous ones of all of Africa, the zebras. Very beautiful, and as you can see, they have all these beautiful black and white straps, but I'll tell you something, the zebras that we get in this particular area, there are many different species, but the ones over here, you can tell they're the zebras from South Africa because of that faint line, I'm sure you can see it in its bottom, that it's there's the black one, the white one, and there, there's one that's almost gray. So that is the very much um, outstanding feature of the zebras we get around here. So just for a bit of a close-up of a zebra's bottom. And now we have two eating. So you see very beautiful creatures and often we will find the gnus and the zebras together. We're hanging out roughly in the same area because they don't eat on the same things. They both eat grass but one of them likes the grass is a little bit longer and the other one likes the grass and it's a little bit shorter so it's almost like going to the cafeteria and everybody else eats something different so they don't really have to fight for what they eat. Although they are following the same direction that the wildebeest were earlier on so perhaps <laughs> they're also going to become ghost zebras as they carry on moving. You see, look at that. It is amazing how as soon as they start moving behind some trees and it's like perhaps the deer or some of the other animals that you might have around home. As soon as they start moving and going behind the trees, it's very hard to see them. So you can see how all the stripes, even when they stand out so nicely out in the open, as soon as they go behind the bushes, it's almost like they disappear. Look at that. I'm sure, imagine if we were driving past here really quickly, we wouldn't be able to see them. You would just be like, oh, you know, it's just a bush down there. And now, thank you, zebra on the left, for posing so beautifully for us. So we get a very nice contrast between the one that's hiding and the one that is not hiding. We can still see you clearly with all those beautiful stripes of yours. Very, very similar to a horse, you may say. But this one's have just got a bit more of a mood. So they're not perhaps as friendly as some of the horses and they're very well known for kicking and biting. So probably not the best pet to have around, <laughs> although I'm sure many people have tried. They are, however, one of my favorite ones around because they're so pretty. Look at those stripes. Now, one of the most interesting things about the zebra is that you see, for us, all of the stripes look pretty much the same. And you think like, oh, you know, they've all got vertical stripes. But actually, if you start paying attention, and hopefully we will see more than one zebra together again, all of their stripes are different. There are no two zebras that look the same. So it's very easy to, if you just look at the spot, to distinguish one zebra from the other. And you'll be able to tell, well, oh, this is zebra number one, and this is zebra number two. Beautiful. Very beautiful zebras. They are feeding peacefully all the way around here. But I think 
just because they are heading into an area that is a bit difficult to follow because we can't really follow them amongst the bushes we are going to carry on on our afternoon bumble and see what else we can we can try and find hopefully might many more things because the weather should be good enough and i'm going to send you across to my friend jamie all the way in the maasai mara in kenya and welcome to the sunset safari my name is Jamie and this afternoon Dave is on camera with me and a special warm welcome to the school kids joining us this afternoon I hope you are all very very excited uh, my friend Ali is all the way in South Africa and Dave and myself are driving around an amazing place called the Maasai Mara in Kenya so you're actually getting to go on safari in two different parts of Africa we're halfway across the continent in the eastern side of Africa in here in Kenya and as Ali's told you I'm looking for cats in fact I'm looking for lions but my biggest problem right now is that the lions are not where we left them this morning which is terribly inconvenient so where do you think a lion might be hiding it's been very very hot today it's looking like it's cooling down and it looks like there might be some rain later but where do you think a lion might have hidden itself I think it's gone to they've gone to hide somewhere in the shade and the lions that I'm looking for have got a very silly name they're known as the sausage tree pride and I don't know where they've gone I'm hoping that they've gone somewhere easy to find maybe they're just really embarrassed about their name and they've gone to hide away I think I'm gonna go down that road so while I go and search under every tree to see if I can find some lions for you let's go back to South Africa so that Ali can give you some more fascinating information Well, thank you. I hope you all enjoyed meeting my friend Jamie. We are also going to try and find lions this afternoon. Now, another one of our guides this morning was very lucky to see a big male lion. So I am hoping we'll be able to see it too and show it to you guys. But it is still a little bit far away from where we are. So we're going to drive along and see what else we can find on the way there. So fingers crossed in the next, I would say 20 minutes or so, we might be able to have a look at the lion because the thing about the lions is that they are very big beautiful creatures but on days like today when it's nice and cool and overcast they tend to move quite a little bit around so they're not always going to stay in the same spot where we left them but it is the best way to go into the last place where we saw them sleeping and the best way to go and check around but while we do that look at this the wildebeest that had disappeared we've bumped into them again Where are you going? So, question from the elementary school. You're wondering if the zebras use their stripes to hide away from predators like the lions. Yes, yes they do. It's one of the main reasons why they have lions. Although there is a whole very big debate amongst all of the people that study zebra as to why, why do the zebras have stripes. Because it's such a beautiful striking animal that just stands out wherever you see it. But some of the consensus is like that they have the stripes so that they can hide from all of the potential predators because as you guys saw as soon as it goes behind the bushes all those stripes actually make it pretty much disappear and the other thing that many people say or that is apparently the new thing that everyone believes is that the Actually, the stripes prevent certain types of flies from landing on the zebras because funny enough the flies don't like the stripes so how's that <laughs> they've got their own natural insect repellent or fly repellent right, tattooed right on their skin which is fairly cool I would say so they have pretty much carried with them they don't have to worry about going to the shop and getting insect repellent or anything like it but yes the stripes also have a very interesting visual effect for example I don't know if you guys noticed or remember when the zebras were feeding close to each other the one was here and the other one was here and it's almost very hard to tell which one where one starts and where the other one ends because they blend in together so it is believed also that it helps to distract the predators because then the predator doesn't know really how far away one particular zebra is or if it's actually the one behind it or the one in front of it so it just confuses them a little bit so they've got all sorts of tricks up their sleeve to be able to survive out here in the African wild. A lot of the animals that we get in this particular area 
do just because they have to <laughs> develop a few tricks against how smart and clever some of the predators are as as you can imagine to try and survive and escape from a lion you've got to be very smart but also you need the help of certain um, features on your skin all right I'm seeing something but I think it's just a tree tree stump in the distance oh no it's a warthog let's see if we can show you what the warthog looks like and the warthog is if you've seen the Lion King it's Pumbaa now Pumbaa is hiding there to the left Ooh. all right there we go running away Ooh. two three four hello little ones <laughs> So that was a mom and it's three young ones running away, three little piglets. And they've carried on running. I can't see them anymore. Let's just keep an eye out for one second, see if maybe they are around. Nope, I think they've carried on running. Oh, there they are, well spotted. Very, very well spotted. Now, if you guys have any questions about the real life Pumba or the Warthog, as we normally call them down here, please feel free there are and maybe I should learn how to talk first <laughs> feel free to send them through you can ask your teacher to send us your questions and we'll be more than happy to answer them look at those three little ones running with their tails up and it is funny because their tails are normally down but when they start running then that's when the tails go up almost like a flag you are hiding very well so you see in this case for example the little warthogs they don't have any stripes like the zebras do but because they are all gray and similar to the colors of their environment then it's very hard to actually spot them so you see they've also gone behind the tree so everybody hides behind the trees over here or amongst the thorny bushes and pretty much you become invisible and it's very hard to see you which is pretty much what they've done very clever of them although we wouldn't hunt them or eat them <laughs> so they're safe from us now let's carry on Seems like this has been a lucky road so far. Some zebras around here, some wildebeest, some warthogs. Chapter elementary, you guys are wondering how many different species of animals do we see in one day? Well, ooh, many different ones. It's very hard to tell sometimes. We can go for hours and maybe see two, three different species of antelope and that's about it. Or maybe just a few different species of bird. Although on days like today where it's very nice and cold, I would suppose that a lot of the animals are just going to be hiding in the bushes where it's nice and warm. So where there, there's a lot more trees just to keep warm and away from the wind. So I don't know, we've actually never done a particular count of total species of animals that we see on one drive. So that might be something interesting to try out one day. But I would say anything from maybe 5 to 20 different species, including birds and mammals and reptiles later on. And then as we go and start doing our bushwalks, what is that we, instead of taking a car and going on safari with the car, then we do it on foot. And then we focus a lot more on the little things and the insects. And now that we've had some of the rain starting, very likely all those creepy crawlies are going to start coming out, which is fantastic news for us. Because then we can start walking and finding a few more things than what we've been used to. So if we count all the insects in, I don't know, maybe if we're very optimistic, maybe one day we can get to 100 different species. It will be very, very nice. Because often also you start seeing them and you can't oh there's impala here there's wildebeest and because you see them a few times and you stop actually counting you get distracted <laughs> which is probably not the best thing to do now let's see what else there is around here like i said i think we're gonna have to go maybe slightly quicker if we want to get to the ma male lion i am hoping that he's still gonna be there so fingers crossed he is but i'm hoping to see also anything else on the way Perhaps even a few spotted animals like the leopards, that would be very nice. Because the leopards are a lot smaller than the lions, but they're also very elegant, very beautiful creatures. Now, let's see. Seems like it's been quite a quiet day. So in South Africa, we are heading into our rainy season. So yesterday, actually, we got so much rain. So, so much rain. Chopped elementary, you're wondering if we get any scorpions in South Africa. Yes, we do get 
couple different species we get some that are very very venomous very when they sting they can actually cause a lot of damage and then we get some others that are not that bad but we do get them in this area and we use especially during the night you can use those uv lights those white lights and if you go particularly to the trunks of the trees or the holes in the trees and they shine it's very funny because of the substances that they have on their skin so we get a few different species around here but those are some of the species that we're hoping that we're gonna get around here now we've got what oh come rusty reverse <laughs> sorry the car doesn't want to reverse we've got two beautiful birds of prey all the way there let's have a closer look now we had a very long debate about a very similar looking bird yesterday but my money is again on Wahlberg's eagles. <laughs> but uh, yes, so we get all different species of birds in this area and some of the ones that we get like this one, they actually migrate. So they don't spend the whole year here. They go all the way to Northern Africa, Europe, and then they come back all the way down in South Africa to have their chicks and then go all the way back. And normally when they come back, we know that the rains are starting because there's gonna be a lot of food, a lot of insects, little things flying around all the way for them. Now I want to try and get them, show them to you in the book because unfortunately the weather is not the prettiest today and it's perhaps not helping us all that much. Now this particular one that we are looking at, now all I can think about is a booted eagle. <laughs> this particular one that we are looking at, it's called the World Burst Eagle and like I said, normally found in pairs. So there's two of them that are always together. And once they've established their nest and where they want to have their nest, then they come or they're reported to come every year back to their nest, every year back to their house. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Now, this is the one that I think that we are looking at. It's called the Wahlberg's Eagle. Very beautiful. And this is actually one of them seems to be quite pale in color, quite white. So they are normally of this color over here on the top this one over here so you see it's actually quite of a brownish color but they can morph into different colors and some of them are actually white so this is a very nice find because this is a very unusual bird to see so yay brownie points for us for some finding something rare but they seem pretty relaxed all the way there so we're gonna carry on and try to make our way all the way to where we want to go which is still <laughs> far away but it's the beautiful thing about the bush we carry on bumbling now, seems like Jamie has managed to find the biggest animal out in the bush, so let's go and have a look. Unusual bird indeed, but what is not unusual to see out here in the Maasai Mara are elephants that are absolutely everywhere. And that for me is a very special thing because of all of the creatures out here, I love spending time with elephants the most. And although I can't spend too long with them today because we've got other things to do, it's nice every now and again to just stop and enjoy their company. Obviously the biggest animal out here and also one that lives for a very, very long time. So this lady here with her big tusks hiding behind the bush, I would say that she could easily be over 35 years old, even around about 40 years old. So an elephant can live right up to 60, even 70. And there's her little one. I would say that that's probably her baby, three or so years old, and a lot of growing to do before it catches up to mum. I'm trying to pretend I'm not hearing the thunder. It's not going to rain on us tonight. So the ki for the kids watching, our plan tonight, if we're so lucky, we get to stay out the whole night with the different animals that are out here. Isn't that incredible? We get to sit and follow the lions. Uh, that's a beautiful question from a Chopped Elementary back onto our elephants before we get talking about lions. Now, Chopped Elementary, and the kids watching, you want to know why do elephants have such big ears? Well, here's the thing about elephants. Obviously, they're very, very big. And because they're very, very big animals, they will get very, very hot in the sun. Especially because they're dark colored and they're outside all day in the baking hot sun and it gets very hot here. So the reason that they have those big ears is it's kind of like a built-in air conditioning unit. 
You know how your body sweats when you get too hot? You get all sweaty and then the sweat evaporates off your skin and it helps to cool you down? This is the way that elephants cool themselves down. So in those ears are blood vessels, lots and lots of blood vessels. If you look at the, if you look at your hand and you see all of the sort of the blue veins and the capillaries running through, so an elephant has a network of blood vessels in there and the blood flows through and the skin is quite thin and then when they flap their ears like that it makes the wind pass over the blood vessels and it cools the blood down and then the blood goes to the rest of their bodies so that's the way that elephants cool themselves down I don't know how many of you perhaps have dogs at home do you have dogs at home you've seen them when it gets really hot they start to pant and that's the similar idea. It's basically bringing air into their, into their mouths and helping to cool the blood down and that goes to the rest of the body. Even the babies have big, big ears. So when an elephant flaps its ears, it doesn't mean that it's angry, it just is trying to cool down. Oh my goodness, the kids are they're really thinking hard about these animals because Chopped Elementary has seen all of the mud that's coating the elephants and they're wondering why do elephants use mud like that. And the reason is, you spot on it, is like a type of sunscreen, but it's for something else as well. So elephants really like to bathe themselves in mud and that mud helps to keep them cool because it stays wet and then it's similar to, to what we were talking about about when you're sweaty. The air blows over the wet mud and it helps to cool them down. Plus, as you said, it acts as a sunscreen so it protects their skin from the harsh, harsh rays of the sun. So I wouldn't suggest that you try it. Maybe, maybe don't cover yourselves in mud. Sunscreen will work just as well. But obviously the elephants can't run down to the shop and buy sunscreen. So the mud helps to protect them. And then there's another reason they do it. So there are lots of small bugs and parasites out here. And things called ticks. And they like to sit on the elephant's skin. Well, if elephants don't have a finger and a thumb to pull the ticks off or the other types of parasites, so by coating themselves in mud, it dries and it helps to get rid of them. And to be quite honest, I think Ellie's just like to play in mud. It's time for me to move on from my Ellie's and go off in search of some lions. And it sounds like that is Ellie's, Ellie's plan as well. Well, we are trying to get to that last spot where that mail was. So hopefully we're not too far away now. I think it's just one more road and then we turn to the left. So hopefully it'll be something somewhere there. And then we have to try and get to where it was last thing, which I'm sure it's going to be interesting because we're going to have to go off road and we're going to have to go into the bush where there are a lot of trees and branches and stumps and everything else to try and get there. But I am not afraid. <laughs> we shall get there at least to start looking for it, which would be very nice. Now it is quite a cold afternoon, so uh, my guess is that most of the animals are actually hiding away because they're all very, very cold, just like us. I am wearing about three different jerseys, so <laughs> it's very cold today. And it feels maybe like it's going to start raining a little bit later on, but that is actually wonderful news for us because in South Africa we have six months roughly every year where it doesn't rain and we're just starting to come out of that period where it doesn't rain, starting to get into the period uh, that we call summer, which is actually the rainy season. So hopefully we'll get some rain because everything around us and I'm sure you guys can notice as we start driving around you see all the grass all of this is very very dry very yellow in color so when we have a nice amount of rain uh, then everything turns green and it's beautiful and so many different colors of green and tunes and hues of, of green it's very pretty. And of course a lot of flowers and all the trees have leaves because now everything's looking pretty much half dead I should say because there are no flowers or leaves or anything on it but I am hoping that's going to change in the next little while and as we were saying later on we're gonna be able to start seeing also a lot of creepy crawlies like the scorpions and the dung beetles <gasps> they are one of my favorite ones out in the summertime and the dung beetles if you're wondering are those tiny little beetles that roll balls of dung and that is the gift to their bride and then that's where that's what they eat and that is where they lay their eggs so that's actually the house for the young ones <laughs> sorry Lou I believe there was a question but I couldn't hear you properly can you just say it again Do 
we have orangutans here? I believe is the question. Um, no, we tarantulas. <laughs> Sorry, that was my bad. I don't know why I heard orangutans. I think maybe I'm going a little bit crazy. Tarantulas. No, we don't have tarantulas, but we have a very similar species of spider that looks very much like a tarantula, but is not a tarantula. It's, I would say, the African version of a tarantula. It's called the baboon spider, and it's also called an old world spider, just because it's, from an evolutionary perspective, it seems like these spiders are a lot older than all of the other ones, and they don't spin beautiful webs like some of the other spiders that we get around in this area do, but actually they, they have their houses underneath the ground. So that would be another one to start looking forward to. And then of course, as it starts getting hotter during the summer days when it doesn't rain, lots and lots of snakes come around here. One of the girls that we work with that is in the final control room and speaks to my ear, Megan, she has gone a little bit crazy and now she sees snakes everywhere. So she's terrifying us all, <laughs> just saying that there are snakes pretty much everywhere. <laughs> because I think she's a little bit scared, but we still haven't seen too many. <laughs> Sorry, Megs. <laughs> but no, snakes shouldn't be feared normally in, on days like today because they are reptiles and they rely on the sun just to warm up and start moving around. On days like today, we wouldn't really be able to see them or they wouldn't actually move around all that much. Now I'm trying to pay attention to the road because there's supposed to be an obvious way for me to try and get in and start heading onto where this lion was last left but as directions go always driving around these roads things are never you know it would be a lot easier if we had signs and be like okay male lion follow this road but i suppose that's what also makes it fun is that we don't have them so it's always the thrill of oh, are we going the right way are we looking at it? it's almost like a treasure hunt where you have to follow all the clues and then if you get lucky and if the animal hasn't moved then there will be the part of rainbow or in this case the male lion at the end of the <laughs> of the road I think it is a bit, a little bit uh, further away, if I'm not mistaken. Mrs. Violet, you're wondering if the lions have ever gotten too close to the safari guides. Um, sometimes they do. Actually, a few nights ago, we had a whole pride that came and right past our vehicle, just here on the side, and then they carried on moving. So. The wonderful thing about the area that we work in is that because animals are not hunted, because they are so used to, from tiny little cubs, they're used to seeing the cars coming very close to them all the time, they just ignore us basically. So they just see us as a giant moving rug that makes a little bit of noise and smells funny and then brrr, comes around, blah 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 blah, brrr, goes away and carries on. So they, sometimes they do get a little bit close, but most times it's just because we are sort of in their way or the area where they want to go and they'll go around us and then they carry on moving. So some of them are quite inquisitive. Oh, I believe that this is my road. Let's go in here and start seeing where it is. All right, I do think that it's quite a long road all the way there. We are getting closer to the last position of this lion. Hopefully it hasn't moved because on days like today, although lions tend to sleep about 16, 18 hours every day, on days like today, sometimes they move a little bit more. So let's hope that he was very tired this morning because I believe he went to sleep very late in the morning and hopefully he'll still be there. But we're going to keep our eyes open just in case, just in case there's something around here. He's moved or gone somewhere else. Interesting. Now, the one male lion that we're going to see or we're trying to find again this afternoon to show to you guys, he is actually part of a group of four lions. So it's four big males together with their beautiful manes and they are together with a few different prides of females. Now, the females don't get along with one another and they all stay in their separate territories, but the males, they go and visit them every now and again. And they're not always together, the boys, and in this case, I think it's just the one that got away. Because if I am not mistaken, some of the reports that we got from some of the reserves nearby was that the lions actually fought with some other unknown lions that we get into this area. Because you see, our reserve in the area where we are, it's 
actually it's got no fences with the national park with Kruger National Park so every now and again you get uh, stranger strangers and animals that are not generally born in this area that come along and then just cause a bit of chaos start moving around but that's what makes it so interesting because it's a proper um, natural environment and we get to see everything that happens and it's almost like watching a soap opera sometimes because you obviously because we see them all the time you get to or well maybe not all the time but it's almost like a like a soap opera Alexandra your name's just like mine you want to know why do male lions have manes well there are a couple of theories about it one of the theories is that they have manes because when male lions fight and they hurt each other and imagine those big claws you know just grabbing you here and there the mane protects their face their ears their throat their nose everything from any potential blow from an opponent but also oh, i fell in a hole but also it's believed that they have manes so that they can differentiate each other from a distance so if a female sees a lion all the way far away she will know it's a male instead of a female this way sorry Senzo was just directing me because he was here today this side okay let's see hopefully it'll be some oh, I see the two track now all right I'm gonna pay a little bit of attention now to the road to try and get, I think it would have maybe been easier to go in that side, but that's fine because good old Rusty will get us there if it doesn't fall too badly in this hole. Alright, let's see. Now, I assume we're getting closer to what it was because there's a dip that I can see ahead of us. So if he is still around here, we should be able to find him soon enough, I hope. Ah, uh, there's the head. <laughs> Hello, big boy. Now, how are we going to play this around? Which way, Senzo? Should we go straight and then... Yeah. Okay, sorry guys, I'm just talking to Zenza to try and find out how we're going to park. That's going to make it easier for everyone to have a look at this beautiful male lion that's right next to us. I think it's probably the way. Hopefully this won't give us a flat tire. Is that good or do I need to go a little bit backwards for you? A little bit back? Okay, sorry guys, we're going to have a look in just a few moments. Just want to make sure that we get the best possible view for the camera because obviously we all really want to see this male lion there he is uh almost <laughs> hello boy how amazing is that now this is a real king of the jungle as they say although we are not in the jungle <laughs> very beautiful and you see we are actually quite close going back to Mrs. Violet question from earlier on we are pretty close to the lion but you see he's carried on doing whatever it is that he was doing before we got here and that is exactly what we want all animals to do when we come and view them we want them to carry on and pretty much ignore us as much as possible because we are just observers we just want to see what they do find out what they get up to learn everything we can about them without ever bothering them I think somebody's going through a bit of grooming and maybe an injury on his paw over there. Seems like he was in a fight actually. It doesn't seem like anything too bad. But it seems like somebody bit him on one of his back legs. Now he's being a very thorough boy and just cleaning himself. So if you've got cats at home, I'm sure you've seen your cat do exactly this, what he's doing. So he's just getting rid of all the little pieces of dirt, grass, pretty much anything that can go onto his, onto his fur, get onto his coat. Because they are very clean animals, so they always like to be very nice and hygien hygienic. <laughs> Even when they... Um, after they've eaten a lot and you can see all their faces are bloody and full of all sorts of disgusting things then when they're done eating they go they take a bath and they take much much care of making sure that they are squeaky clean so beautiful I think one of my other friends from the Maasai Mara is also out and about and he has 
also managed to find one of my favorite birds out in the Maasai Mara. So we are going to stick around with this boy while he <laughs> has a bath and make sure that he's sparkling clean. But while we stay with him, let's go over to Brent and see a very interesting looking turkey, almost. Well, from one of the biggest feline predators in Africa to one of the biggest avian predators in Africa, we have ground hornbills, and it's caught a little turtle. And they've got such a powerful beak, they're able to crack the turtle's uh, shell and uh, eat the yummy turtle if you're a, if you're a hornbill. And uh, a big welcome to the Maasai Mara. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have. Craig, who's also known as Batman on camera, and remember this is live with these big birds eating that turtle. You can actually hear it crushing up the skull. So the turtle, the turtle is dead already. The hornbills managed to open up the turtle, but it's still using it beak as a pick to break open more of the shell to get better pieces. Poor little turtle. Didn't manage to get to the water fast enough because it was probably moving from a puddle to another puddle but it unluckily came across the very big ground hornbill. So very few things are able to crack open the turtles and tortoises shell and this is one of the few. The other is hyenas and uh, sometimes lions. But they generally prefer a bigger meal. Whether it's for this hornbill, this is a, a really nice big meal. See how sharp their beaks are. Well, this is not something you get to see every day. It's going to take quite a while for this hornbill to open up that turtle. Now, all you guys there at school, you're being a bit quiet. I want to hear questions from you and also from our viewers. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Um, if you have any questions about what is happening with this glorious big ground hornbill crushing up uh, the poor little turtle. Now, it's not a tortoise, I can tell, uh, from the shape of the shell. Uh, tortoise would have a much higher shell, a, a sort of different shape. So this is one of the little aquatic turtles or terrapins that live in all the mud wallows and rivers and puddles in Africa. I'm going to leave this beautiful bird to finish his dinner because I'm going way down south to see if I can find a leopard or a cheetah. And while I do that, let's head back to Ali all the way in South Africa with the big brutish Birmingham boys. Well, we have managed to find a new spot, but I apologize because I need to get a hold of somebody on the radio that wants to come and also see the big male lion. Rob, sorry, um, I was busy on the radio. You are more than welcome to make your way. There is only myself here. Um, like Chris was saying, best access is via Haryuna Road and then you'll see the branch on the road. Hey, from come Hyena Road. Copy. 
All right, sorry guys, we, when we go out on drives for security reasons and also just because we help each other out, we have a radio with us, so when we find something that's very big or very interesting to watch, then we have to call it in on the radio because there might be somebody else that also wants to come, so I was doing my duty and just making sure that everybody else knew um, that we are here with this lion. Although, luckily for us, not too many people want to come around because it seems like there are more lions in other places so it means that yay for us we get to spend a little bit more time with him now still busy grooming itself Virginia you're wondering why do lions bathe themselves with their tongues well they don't really like the water uh, and also here the water in Africa is very dangerous. There are hippos, there are crocodiles, all sorts of things that might want to hurt a lion. So like the domestic cats that also don't like taking a bath, they have learned that the best way to get clean is just use their tongue. And their tongue, if you have a pet at home, their tongue is very, very rough. So it's not nice and smooth like ours, but it's actually got tiny little, um, what can I call them? tiny little particles that almost act like a cum so whenever he's licking his skin he's getting all the dirt out and all the extra hair and so on and of course because all of his saliva is there then all of the the water or the watery side of his saliva then makes everything dislodge a little bit easier and get out of his skin so you see he's doing a very good job at it And you see there's the wound that he's got you see that hole there so judging by the shape of the of the wound i'm pretty sure that what happened there was that another lion bit him because it looks like a canine one of those very big teeth that went straight in probably got bitten in the back but it's not bad lions often get all sorts of injuries and you see he is now busy cleaning itself making sure that nothing strange no maggots nothing goes in there just to make sure that it heals a lot quicker. But like I was saying, reports are that apparently this lion fought with another one. Chopped Elementary, you guys are wondering how long do lions live for? Well, it depends if you're a boy or a girl. So the male lions, the boy lions like this one with very big manes because they are have to fight and protect their territories and their females and their cubs from any other uh, lions that might be in the area, they tend to live a little bit less at some than the females. So a male lion, a boy lion can live for about 10 to 12 years, whereas a female that lives in a family with all the other aunts and sisters and etc, they can live for maybe about 15 years. So it changes obviously from one area to the other, but roughly that I would say that's a good average for them. Definitely making sure that there's nothing funny in that wound. You see, living down here on the ground and sleeping on the soil gets all sorts of little things in all those wounds. So he's got to be very careful to make it very clean. <laughs> Almost looks like a big cat, doesn't he? With all that pretty, all that pretty mane and all that black hair that he's got there. But I'm sure it's not as soft as it would, <laughs> as it appears. I'm sure it's full of knots. Now, if you look at his face, you can tell. Look at all those scars on his nose. So they have a very tough life. They've got. Uh, they constantly fight with one another. And even when they manage to hunt something, and they're all eating something big, like a buffalo or perhaps a big antelope. Uh, they all fight and they all growl at each other and they all hurt because even when they eat even if it's the same family They all try to to get more food So imagine if you're like at a big Thanksgiving dinner and everyone's fighting to get the bigger piece of the turkey That's roughly what it is when the lions are eating all the time They just fight because they're all They're actually all really fatties and they all just want to eat as much as they can <laughs> and they have to to survive so some of the wounds they get from fighting with family members, some of the wounds they get them from fighting with females, and some of the wounds they get when hunting. Beautiful. Right, Chopped Elementary, it has been a pleasure having you guys with us on dry this afternoon. Very happy we managed to see some lions and elephants and of course the ground hornbills, which is very, very cool for the afternoon. And we hope to see you again next time. But we hope that you enjoyed. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the non-school drive part of the drive. <laughs>
for lack of a better word. And we are here with, I think it's Tinio, if I'm not mistaken. He was seen here this morning, and this is where Tristan left him off. And doesn't seem like he's moved too far, thankfully, for all of us, because the boundary is actually not too far away from where we are. So we are very happy that he is here. Because since I've arrived at Juma, we've heard them roaring every night, so many times, just before drive starts, and by the time that you jump in the vehicle and start getting out, they have gone up somewhere else. Now, he does have a bit of a wound on his back leg, but like I was saying earlier, I don't think it's anything, I don't think it's anything too dramatic. I think I'm sure he'll be fine, and I was reading the update from, I think it was in Koro today, that apparently the other male lion actually had the worst um, side of it all, and unfortunately, um, the other male lion was actually found dead. So it seems like the Birmingham boys are here to stay, doing a very good job at defending his territory, his females, and everyone around. Now, updates on the radio are funny, because apparently I think there are two of the Birmingham boys on a buffalo maybe I don't know if it's a buffalo, but they are on a kill somewhere on Torchwood, I want to say, not too far from here so I wonder if this one is actually at some point gonna go join them oh, there's a little bit of blood there perhaps you should... do you have a little bit of blood on your lip now? that wasn't there before, was it? maybe he's reopened his wound huh, I wonder what just happened, maybe actually by cleaning his wound he's actually... <laughs> made it a little bit worse because it seems like it's all around there but like I said I don't think it's anything to be too worried about maybe if we can just we'll just hang around a little bit more see if maybe he's got something on his lips yeah he's got some blood there that I'm pretty sure wasn't there before oh thank you for opening that up now if you can just move your head a little bit so we can have a look <laughs> that will be very kind of you Oh, the gash there on the other leg. Okay. Hadn't seen that one before. Hmm. Well, that one looks a little bit more serious than the other one, but I also still don't think that this is too bad, judging by this angle. But we'll see. Oh, boy. Now you've put a lot more blood. Okay, perhaps he does have a bigger entry, because now that you've raised your head like that, you've put a lot more blood on your head. <laughs> He does look like a fierce warrior now, doesn't he? Sure. I feel a little bit sorry for you now with all this blood, but I would like it if you stood up so that we could assess your wounds. Mm. Hello, boy. And uh, yes, like I was saying earlier, some of more of the updates on the radio is that the Enkahumas are on Bufalsuk after a little bit of an absence, so hopefully they'll come uh, to us tomorrow. Oh, sorry, somebody's calling Taylor, but they actually mean Ali. Standing by. It's not too far from the Bovosa uh, cut line, so you'll see it's a prominent two track and there's a Gwari branch on the road. Alright. Sorry, just trying to direct somebody onto the sighting. I think we're all quite interested in trying to see where all of this blood is coming from because I think he might have another wound somewhere in there because the gash at the bottom was didn't seem the one that was bleeding all that much. But perhaps what he did was actually when he stretched his leg, that puncture wound that he's got there, that's what he put on his face. And because of the stretching and so on, and because it hasn't scabbed yet, maybe that's where the blood came from. boy you see you should stay around here <laughs> less lions to fight around this area <laughs> Elizabeth you're wondering if we ever intervene when animals are hurt well different parks and reserves have different policies but in the savvy sand if it's something that's caused by another animal if it's a natural um, issue then we do not intervene the reserve doesn't do anything rather than let to the nature take its own course so for example for an injury like this we would not intervene because sometimes it's also putting the animal under a lot of stress because a lot of the times you have to dart them and then redart them and they become very skittish and they don't like the vehicles and also I if I've learned something by watching particularly lions in the last few years is that they're very resilient animals and sometimes we get really scared because there's a lot of blood and we're really worried but they just have a way of pulling through they're very actually very 
very strong creatures and I think that's probably where the name the king of the jungle really does apply to them so unless it's a it's a human cause problem like for example a snare around somebody's foot or neck or ankle you, you are looking like a proper warrior now look at that then no we do not intervene this is a natural environment and that's part of the beauty and the horrible part of it we let uh, nature take its course and we let animals sort themselves out <laughs> for a moment there I thought he was biting his own tail <laughs> oh he is pulling his tail that is quite funny also getting the tail very clean <laughs> Oh, this is quite funny. A lion pulling its whole tail. <laughs> Alrighty. Very beautiful. So he has been cleaning himself quite a bit. So I wonder if perhaps he didn't move around and that's why there is a lot of more blood. But if you've got any questions we or any comments, we actually love hearing from everyone who's watching. So if you want to send us a tweet using the hashtag Safari Live or on the YouTube channel, we are more than happy to hear from you and address any possible questions that you may have. Like I said, we've been sitting with this male lion, which has been quite fantastic in the sense that his head is up and he's moving a little bit around and he's allowing us to see what's going on. Because often lions will sleep throughout the day and if he were lying on the side, it would be quite difficult to actually see any of these wounds. And of course, we don't want to get that close because then we would bother it and likely he would go away and start moving. But I think the fact that he's got his head up and that he's um, cleaning and grooming himself so thoroughly could be that maybe he wants to move. Jared Barry, you're wondering what we would do with the with the dead lion and if there's any information that gets taken from it. Yes, so whenever there's a dead lion that's found, it is reported to the conservation officers of the reserve and then they are responsible for doing a post-mortem exam of the animal. Often they will also to take the animal parts because, uh, or to try and avoid any possible um, theft of animal parts. Uh, lion bones in particular, lion skins, uh, the same as leopards and some other parts of some other animals, are very prized in black markets. So it's, it's a way of trying to avoid the temptation of leaving uh, the skull of a lion here and somebody else coming and eating it or taking it or selling it or whatever the case. But the first step would be, like I said, they would do a full post-mortem exam to try and find out if it died from natural causes, blood loss, etc, etc. Just to rule out any possible diseases or anything that might, um, that might be harmful for the environment or perhaps other lions that might be living in the area. Are you going to get up, boy? I think you might just get up. The weather is good. Or are you... what are you doing? Are you getting up? Are you getting... going down? Are you scratching? I think Tinio hasn't quite decided what he wants to do. Perhaps he's just gonna scratch for a little while. We are going to stick around with him just in case he does decide to move because often they will go down and carry on sleeping. But while they do that, let's go to Jamie who's got some tiny little bit lions. Well, speaking of flat lions, we've saw, we found some of our own. We are back with the Angama pride, since the sausage tree pride decided to give us the slip well and truly. We are back with the Angama, or at least some of the Angama pride, including one that's decided that that tree is the best possible pillow. And then one little one off to the right, looking a little bit lost and bemused. And in fact, like it wants to get up and play, more likely. I have absolutely no idea where the rest of the pride is. I assume they are off in the trees somewhere, but I'm not entirely sure. Dave, I'm sorry, but can we have another look at that lion cub that's lying on the... Tr oh, it's shifted around now. The one was lying on the tree, so beautifully using it as a pillow. It's too sweet. Well, you've got to make do with what you've got out here. Sometimes the ground is, oh sweet, 
Sometimes the ground's a little bit too hard, and the tree's the next best thing. So we've got four, which means we're missing 13 of the members of the Angama Pride, three lionesses and the other ten cubs are absent somewhere around here. Our plan for the afternoon will be, oh, fingers crossed, to stick with them. At the moment they we are where we can off-road. They might decide to go across the road, in which case Dave and myself will have to look for other things. And of course all of this building up to our final installment of our migration series on, well for us Saturday morning, for I think most of you it will be on Friday night. Obviously I know we've got viewers in Australia and the UK so that doesn't apply for everyone. But it will be our final, final TV show for the migration special at least. And then we're all going to look like that cub, aren't we Dave? Three nights out here and come Saturday morning I think we're all going to be in much the same position. Hopefully with a pillow rather than a branch but you never know. Don't forget, because this is a live safari that you are on, to send through your comments or your questions on hashtag safari live on Twitter in much the same way that Catherine has done. Catherine, you say they are so cute. They are, aren't they? Especially, and I think it makes for a nice contrast to Ali's sighting. It sounds like there's been a little bit of drama in terms of the male dynamics in the Sabi Sands with the Birmingham boys. So it makes a nice contrast to that particular sighting. Especially that little chap. Okay, so Proud Cat Mama, we want to know roughly how old these cubs are. This one, I would say, this is one of the. Oh gosh, we, get, we have set A, B, C, and D. <laughs> From oldest being A and D being youngest. This is C, set C, and that would make them around about. Hold on a sec about four months old, maybe four and a half months old. I'd say closer to four. The youngest set is around about three and a half months old. The older cubs, A and B, are between the ages of, I would say, around about six and a half months now and must be close to nine, the oldest set. Let me think. They looked, they were about six months old when we first, when we first got here between five and six months old and we've been here for one, two, three months. Yeah, so you're looking around about nine months old. As our lions snooze away, fortunately at peace with the world, Tinio of course has not had a very peaceful night. Let's go and see how he's doing this afternoon. Well, he is doing fine and he was actually just about to start roaring so I'm hoping he's gonna do it again because it was quite unexpected but there he, I think he is trying to get a hold of the other lions that might be not too far from from here because as far as I understand it some of them are in Torchwood some of them are around so I'm sure some of them will be able to hear him and perhaps he's just trying to get hold of them so I am hoping you're gonna start roaring again boy are you Fighting off the usual flies around. <laughs> no? No more roaring? I think we've got to give him a chance to fight off all the annoying flies. <laughs> now, I was asking Senzo. He was walking just fine this morning, so I don't think... It's probably not too much to worry about because when he got up he was looking a little bit stiff so I wonder if he was actually not um, he, if he's not just actually stiff from sleeping the whole day rather than actually hurt because from what I understand he walked quite a distance this morning I think that this was a good idea to try and get to see him before before he started walking or before he pardon me before he got up and started moving around
I did and did. You're wondering if there are any diseases that affect lions psychologically, like distemper, where rabies affects lions. It's one of the diseases that affects lions quite a bit. Um, and then, well, there are all, I'm not too sure about it from a psychological perspective, but there are all sorts of other diseases that affect them. Sorry, guys. One of the guys on the radio is trying to get a hold of me, and he's been trying to get into the sighting, but I don't know how he missed us. So. I'm gonna switch on for you. So he is actually quite lost, and we saw him perfectly well, but him and all his guests missed us, so I'm just turning on the car so that he can hear us. But now I'm gonna turn it off because he's roaring. Negative I'm on the eastern side of the road. If you come from Hyena Road, that's my vehicle not to look. Better than a vehicle and me talking is a lion roaring to try and get people here. Thank you, Tinia. That was very kind of you. Ralph, did you get the Angola audio? Was quite impressive. He might be hurt, but he is very, very, very proud of making it well known to everyone that he's around here. Um, he has gone back down, so I think maybe we're gonna spend a little bit more time with him just to make sure if he stays around or if he roars again, because I strongly believe that there's nothing like the sound of a lion roaring, which is quite amazing. But while I do that, I think Jamie still, with those tiny little cubs, are up to a lot of nonsense. So let's go over to her and have a look. So while Ali assists whoever it is that would like to find her male line and share that sighting with her, we've got these two starting to get up and moving about. A little male there wandering towards one of the lionesses. Oh, flop. After all that, that was just far too much effort for the day. I think the lioness agrees as well. <laughs> How innately cat-like is that? Playful, paws in the air. From a pillow to a chew toy. I would say that around about the sage, he'd still be getting his teeth, his permanent teeth, and that process will continue for another couple of months. And a warm welcome to Jared's buddy, while we watch this one cub entertain himself for now with a branch. You want to know how far the cubs will stray from each other. It is interesting to watch and something that I've really enjoyed about these nighttime safaris when we've spent time, especially with the Angama cubs, to learn a little bit about the way that they interact with each other. It very much depends upon... <laughs> one's come to the other end now. It very much depends upon the the ages of the cubs and the situation that they're in. So I've often seen older <laughs> tug of war, older cubs wander off with the adults um, and the younger cubs instinctively know to stay behind because that's no, my stick. Come on, stick's big enough for both of you. And the younger ones instinctively know to stay close to their den site in those first few weeks that they're exploring and going out and about. And then as they get older, they'll spend more and more time up, sort of following behind the adults and learning a little bit about hunting. But I've noticed when the adults leave them, when the adults actually manage to ditch them all in one go, the cubs tend to curl up all together at night. And that's actually really very valuable for the younger cubs to have older cubs present because the older ones have slightly more experience, they're slightly more alert. And you'll see that when hyenas, in the times that I've seen hyenas approach the lion cubs, 
while the parents are away. It's the older ones that pick up on the, the, the hyenas first, and they get up and run, and then the little ones instinctively follow them. So that bond is actually really quite useful. And it pays. If you're a younger, uh, younger cub, admittedly, you'll probably get bullied and pushed around a little bit. Oh, look at those claws coming out. There's a brief stretch there. Extending them from their sheath, his sheath. Just see the one there. So although the little cubs have to really push and fight for their place at a carcass, and they often get knocked over and bowled over, it still pays to have older cousins around you when night falls and the lionesses have to go out hunting. I mean, the hyenas, uh, not the hyenas, the lionesses will leave their cubs for hours at a time when they have to go and find food and they'll often cover several miles in doing so. Hey girl, you contemplating a long hard night ahead? I wonder what your plans are. Not hungry. They've eaten since the last time I saw them. No, that's absolute nonsense. The last time I saw them they were full. That was yesterday morning, Dave. Time flies. And while our lions content themselves in various poses, some peaceful, some playful, let's go across to Tinil, who I think after his fight is giving himself a good clean. Yes, now he is, um, I believe he's done with the roaring. He just let everyone know that he's here. And how amazing was that to hear him roaring throughout the day? I just love it. It's one of the most incredible sounds in here. And lucky today, on a very cold day like today, the sound is probably going to travel further away. So he is making it very well known that even if he's hurt <laughs> and perhaps not looking at his more regal point, he's still a warrior and he's still here, ready to fight anyone that might dare come onto his territory. Now it seems like he's also got a bit of a gash on his lip, on the left hand side of his lip. There we go. Also an another bit of an extra wound, so I'm sure whatever fight these guys had, it must have been quite a, quite a vicious one. As it is normally with male lions fighting. It's never a pleasant affair to, to find more than one coalition of males with another one, because normally it's a fight to the death or it can get quite gruesome. Now I think he might have another wound underneath one of his legs, just by judging by the amount of blood, but I'm sure he'll be fine. Macy, you're wondering if a male lion's roar is l lighter, louder, sorry, than the one of a female. Yes, you can tell, y it takes a little bit of getting used to, or to hear the difference between a male and a female roaring, but after a while you can pick up, because it, the, the male's roar has got more... I want to say more strength into it. I don't know how to put it into words. It's it's more um, guttural. It, it's more it, you can feel that it comes from deeper in. And whereas the females also roar, and it's a sound to be very scared of. It's not as loud as the one of the males. Because the females, yes, they also roar to advertise their territory. But I think there's a bit more pride in the males to to uh, when they roar, just because they are advertising their presence to all of the other male lions and they are not scared of fighting. But it was so unexpected to hear him roar, that was, I think, oh, my favorite surprise for the afternoon. That was great. And now he's gone back down. So I'm gonna stick around just a little bit longer, just to see if perhaps he does roar again. Otherwise, we might try our luck with Kuchava later on, because I haven't met Kuchava yet, and I would definitely love to see her. And I know Taylor would also like to see him, so maybe we'll do this one for her as well. <laughs> While we wait for this beautiful boy to finish grooming. I think maybe that's going to be your cue. Once he finishes grooming, we'll find out what he wants to do, if he wants to start moving around, or if he actually just wants to roar again which is what I'm hoping for, or perhaps he'll just go back to sleep. PG, you're wondering if a lion would roar even when it's injured. Um, yep, yeah, well he is injured, and he... Sorry, um, BG, I think I got the question wrong. You're wondering if lions 
are afraid to fight. Is that correct, Lou? Sorry, I'm, you're breaking up a little bit, so I can't hear everything. All right. Sorry, PG. Third time's the charm. Um, would he refrain from a fight while he's injured? Likely, he, yes. Likely he'll try to avoid other male lions because he is still injured and obviously he wants to get better. Or perhaps finding his brothers would also be good because, as we all know, there's safety in number, even for lions. So part of the roaring could also be that he wants to try and find out where the rest of his coalition is, where the other ones are, and probably throughout the night, or hopefully throughout the night, they'll meet up again and they'll find each other. So they will, um, they will become a little bit um, quieter while they are injured, especially if they have a really bad injury, because roaring also gives your position away. So if you are around and there are other younger, stronger male lions that want to try and push you away, sometimes they will just go straight onto where they heard that roar to provoke a fight. In this case, I think he knows what the outcome of that fight was, and it's that the other two males that came from the Kruger side, I think, were, well, one of them died and the other one, I think, ran away. So he's also reasserting his territory and his dominance, and it's probably why he's not afraid to roar. Oh, hello, boy. So he is looking a little bit stiff. But that could also be from sleeping around the whole day. And you're still scratching. <laughs> Imagine the power of those claws. Maybe you've got a hairball? You've been doing a lot of grooming. I am just <laughs> trying to wishfully thank him to roar again just because it's such a wonderful sound and when he roared earlier on this is pretty much what he did so I feel like if I talk I might interrupt him <laughs> oh, look he's yes Amazing! <gasps> Oof, that was that was really really good. And to have it roaring straight at us, I, there is no feeling like quite like it. Now he's he's walking just fine. Like I said, I do think judging by when he walks, just by the blood that's underneath, that he might have another wound somewhere there, and he's got a little bit of a limp. But I think it's nothing to be too concerned about. I think part of it is probably because it's a cold day and he's a little bit stiff. So I think maybe that's why he's walking that way. Now he's heading straight um, east in this direction. So if he carries on going along that side, he's going to hit the boundary and perhaps carry on and cross over to where the other ones are reported to be. So let's follow him around and see what he does. Here comes the bundu bashing. Cheryl, you're wondering if any of the other boys have roared back yet. No, not that I've heard. I think he's... Two of them are probably going to be somewhat quiet because they've got a kill and I'm sure they don't want to share it. Hmm. I don't know which way I'm going to go around here. Um, but we haven't heard them yet. So hopefully in the next little while, some of them might roar back because the Nkuhumas, I believe, are also not too far away. So the Nkuhuma girls could also start roaring back. Thank goodness for these tiny Land Rovers that allow us to get everywhere. <laughs> All right. He is, however, still scent marking. So I think this whole show that he's putting on us is just to remind everyone of who actually the boss is. Now, I'm trying to find the most open way out. Hopefully... I think this way actually because it's gonna get tricky if we follow that game path where he's walking I hope this doesn't backfire all right 
Seems like this was actually an old two track. Woohoo! So you see in front of us, he's rubbing his head against bushes, he's putting his tail up, he's scent marking, so he is doing his full territorial display. Sorry about the impromptu uh, stopping, I just wanted you guys to be able to have a look at this. So normally when lions mark their territory, that's exactly what they do. They'll put up their head and start rubbing their heads against the bushes because they've got some scent glands on their faces and they'll use them to just leave their scent over here and then of course they turn around and they urine spray on bushes and everything else. So roaring face marking, if we can call it like that, which is also scent marking and then urine spray. The typical things that a male lion does to advertise its territory. Now, this is getting a little bit complicated in here. Ooh. Bug marker, you say that we are the luckiest people in the world to be here with these magnificent creatures. I fully agree with you. I think <laughs> I'm grateful every day. Ooh, there's a big hole. Well, first of all, for not dying into a hole, but also to be able to spend as much time as we do with these animals and just hearing them roar live and being able to share it with everyone. It's, it's, a, it's very much an indescribable feeling. Now, um, Ralph, if you go around, I can't c carry on forward. Yeah, I think we're going to have to find another way in. Although this one doesn't seem too bad. Mm. What do you say, Senzo? Should we risk it? Alright, let's... Let's try this out. Alright. We shall carry on trying to battle the bushes and the bush do bashing and see if perhaps we can get another view of this boy because he's walking in quite a complicated spot. Ooh. I'm hoping we're not gonna die. Woohoo! Well done, Rusty. Now, all I've gotta do is try and find out how to get through here, but while I figure this out in this gigantic puzzle, let's go over to Jamie and the beautiful, beautiful Angamas. That's not what we want at all for this afternoon safari. I'm hoping my lions don't decide to, in Ali's words, book out and disappear. I'm deeply concerned by the fact that there's only four of them here. It's making me wonder where the rest are. My imagination's providing me with plenty of options. Most of them are going to be tricky. Hey sleepy cubs. Obviously for our new viewers you'll see that there's another vehicle in the sighting with us driving past. That's because people can come and visit this park we're in the Mara Triangle and on the other side of the Mara National Reserve. Tourists do come and explore through tourism tour companies or with private guides uh, or with staying with the lodges. And of course it provides a very valuable income that then goes towards conserving these creatures and keeping this land as it was intended to be as a refuge and a sanctuary for the wild animals here. And of course the more people are out the more eyes to spot things and to help us spot things. This lioness looks thoroughly unimpressed with life. It's just because she's nice and relaxed, but earlier on the young, youngest cub that's here tried to suckle from her and there was much growling and grunting and groaning from her side. She wasn't terribly impressed. Where's the rest of your family, girl? It was really quite interesting the first few weeks that I spent pretty much with the Angama Pride all the time. Almost every night we were with the Angama Pride. And what was interesting there was the way that one of them always would, would disappear around the early evening and then come back and the rest of them would follow her. It was almost, and I don't, don't, please don't take this as an absolute, it almost felt like she'd gone ahead to scout and then they, the rest of them were following her. I don't think it's nearly as simple as that, but it seemed that way. Which actually kind of links in quite well with Paula's question, who's wondering, will the Pride ever split up to patrol or to look for new territory? To look for new territory, 
All right, this is a bit, of, a bit more complex. Let me try and explain it in a way that's quite simple. Most of the time, the lionesses are not looking to expand their territory. They do sort of patrol or scent mark, but only really as they're going along when they're looking for food. They don't have specific territorial routes that they walk to go walk along the boundaries. That's more a male lion thing, where male lions will actually go out on patrol and they will scrape their feet and scent mark. The prides don't really do that. They will scent mark, but it's, it's more sort of as they go along. They do roar to mark their territory, but they're not really looking to defend its borders. And prides don't tend to come into conflict, conflict as often as male lions do. Then, the situation where a lion might split away from the pride to look for new territory, it's more territory, it's, it, it, those sorts of situations occur when you get a male takeover. So in a situation where you've got a takeover with new males coming in, you know new males kill the cubs to bring the females back into estrus and to pass on their own genetics. What often happens then is, let's say there's a couple of females in the group and only one of them or two of them have very tiny cubs that are in serious danger. Sometimes what they'll do is they will flee with those cubs and the rest of the pride stays behind, starts to mate with the new males, gets accustomed to them, and the other female will try and flee with her young cubs to try and keep them safe. Most of the time it doesn't work, but every now and again it does, and you end up with breakaway prides. Sometimes in adjacent territories, sometimes quite far away from their original prides territory. Depends how far they have to run. And sometimes if it's a really big pride, they split up when they hunt just because it makes more sense. <laughs> Proud cat mama, I always wonder about that, about how the lions communicate to the cubs to stay rather than to follow them. Because it's easy to see how they tell the cubs to follow them to a kill. And they'll go up and they'll give those very soft, low contact calls and the cubs will come out going, ow, ow. Well, that, that's pretty simple to see, but how they tell them to stay, most of the time it's a signal that I would say is invisible to us as human beings, but I think that there's visual communication happening with the, with the lionesses. Sometimes what you will see, though, is with both with lions and with leopards, when they're trying to get their cubs just to stay in one place, and they just the cubs are just being naughty and following behind them, sometimes they will turn around and give them a smack or a snarl. It does occasionally happen. But most of the time, I think the cubs also just instinctively know how to behave. All right, quickly back across to Ali because Tinio appears to be missioning out of Juma. He is quickly missioning. We have gone across around and come onto the road. I'm sure he's going to pop onto the road in the next few seconds or so. Just because wherever he was going, there he comes, we couldn't follow. And like I said, we're not too far away from the boundary and he's heading straight for it. So I think he might be heading on to either where the Inkahumas are or where the other two male lions were. Ralph, he's here. He's just crossing the fire break now. Sorry, guys. Don't have to keep the guys updated as to where he goes and what he's doing. Funny enough, the only way, or the only reason that I knew how to <laughs> go ahead of him and find a new way is because we had an Mvula sighting not too far from where he's been walking. <laughs> so good knowledge of the area definitely was helpful to try and avoid as many things as we could. So I'm going to try, yes, I'm going to try and get in front of him just as he goes on to just so that we can have a look, one last look at him as he comes because he's definitely going to cross this road and then he's going to be lost to us at least because we won't be able to follow him any further all right Senzo there's your money shot Woohoo! Oh, you are such a stunning boy aren't you Head, my head as you can see he's quite close to us <laughs> and I'm just trying to get my head out of the shot and off he goes he's just crossing onto buffalo sick now
Beautiful. Now, I know this means nothing to the animals, but he's just crossed one of our boundaries. So unfortunately, where he's gone... Oh my goodness, are you going to sleep there? <laughs> where he's gone, we cannot follow. Or we cannot try and get a closer look of him. He's just gone static north of the Bofosa cut line. Three vehicles here. All right, how was that? That was fairly amazing. And I think maybe with that, we should thank Tinio for such a spectacular performance that he's put on today. And very likely just move off so we can give other people a chance to have a better view. Because we, I think we've been very, very lucky. I just don't want to carry on moving while everybody else moves. So we're gonna wait for some of the cars to stop moving and then we're gonna head off. But I think this was such a wonderful view of him. I'm definitely super happy that he also roared because that is probably the best thing that lions do is when they roar. Let me go. What is this, Bobby? You say, have a safe trip, Mr. Lion. I think maybe we should say now as well, have a nice news because <laughs> likely that's what he's gonna do carry on sleeping. Are you done now? Beautiful. Right guys, I think we should be very thankful of what we've just seen and I think the other males are further into Bufflesuk so I think it's our time to say goodbye to this beautiful Tinium and perhaps carry on see if we can or at least I can make a new acquaintance and meet the beautiful Kuchala. So we'll carry on see what else we can find along the way but not a bad time to spend our afternoon especially on a raining day like today I think it was very very good and also of course we'll give the chance to somebody else to come because now that he's moved into the open there are a few more people that want to come and have a look so we shall leave this beautiful boy he's gone back to grooming <laughs> just making sure he's very clean and what a wonderful afternoon thank you all right gonna be leaving the look of this Madonna and Gala Ralph in charge perfect <gasps> alrighty how was that that was so cool <laughs> I love it when they start roaring <laughs> I think it's the best thing alright I managed to get out of low range which I forgot to do but it's very necessary when you go bashing around the bush so Kuchala I believe was seen somewhere around Chitsa today and we are not too close to there but we're slowly going to start making our way there. We've still got the opportunity to be surprised by pretty much anyone else. So we are going to slowly start making our way in that direction and while I do that I will send you across to Jamie who's still enjoying the company of those beautiful lions. I hope that Ali finds Kuchava and will keep you entertained while she goes off in search of a spotted cat with cats that haven't yet lost their spots especially the littlest one and for our new viewers young lions are spotted especially tiny tiny cubs they have very spotty coats and it helps to keep them hidden and camouflaged while they're young and then those spots fade with time as they grow older but they never disappear completely so we don't tend to think of lions being spotted but they definitely do have spots this is the laziest example of playful behavior I think we could possibly provide. <laughs> Sleepy play. They're awake and restless but not quite ready to be full of their normal boisterous energy. They're just going to use each other's ears as chew toys. Seems like a comfortable thing. Debbie, I really, really, it's something I know I need to get on to. I really need to do a proper head count. I have counted at least four young males in the Angama, the, the current Angama cub collection, if you could call it that. But I haven't got a proper accurate count. Uh, I don't know whether any of the other guides have, if they've stopped and been able to have a sighting where they can. I, I've counted at least four 
but I honestly haven't done a fully accurate count. It's something that we're going to have to do when we get all of them gathered together. I'll tell you what, I'll try and do it tonight. I haven't spent much time with the Angamas when they've been in an area that I can off-road. So hopefully if they decide to stay here where they are, then we'll be able to do a check out and have a look-see. So it definitely is really valuable in terms of, of telling the story of the animals and the way that their lives progress. It really is very valuable to know just how many young males you have in a group. Because of course, like if you have a situation with the Angamas, no, the Inkahumas is what I mean, where only one of the current one of the current set of cubs, apart not excluding the youngest ones, which obviously I haven't seen, only one of them is a male, and the same applied to their previous cubs. And you've got a situation where that poor young male, when it comes time to move off, has to move off on his own. And if he's lucky, go off and find a buddy to form a coalition with. Whereas if you've got a situation where there's three or four or five or six young males, they'll actually be able to move off together, which I think must be really, could only be considered to be an advantage. Safety in numbers, more help with the hunting. Rice, I agree. I think that this pride is particularly healthy looking and beautiful. Not that I, I've seen many unhealthy looking lions in the, in the Maris while I've been here. I've heard from the other guides that during the sort of the a time of year where the wildebeest have vanished completely and it apparently it, bec and it, it goes into the dry season. Apparently some of the lions do get quite thin. But so far my experience has been that the lions all look very well fed and very happy. I mean they really do look gorgeous in this golden, golden sunlight that's just decided to pop out. Nikki, if you look really closely at the cubs, obviously our lioness will never have a mane, but if you look really closely at cubs of around about six months old, you start to see just a faint fluffiness around the edges of their face. And then by a year it's really quite clear that they are attempting to grow a mane. I, I always use this comparison, but it always feels that way. There you go, you can see he's got a little bit of a ridge of hair along the back of his neck and just slightly fluffy cheeks. I always feel as though young male lions look like um, look like they are attempting to grow, like teenage boys attempting to grow their first beard. And you know, you get the straggly patchy bits. That's what young male lions always remind me of. I've got such a soft spot for them. Now they start, it grows most in the center and around the cheeks, and it's only really when they're about five or six that, they, that it fills out completely and properly. Between then they have a mohawk, which is quite endearing in its own way. Yes, little one. We're talking percentage of males. Of course, it's great if we compare it to the Inkahumas, it's, it's great that the Inkahumas have lots of lionesses growing up to bolster their numbers. It sucks for the little male, but it's great for the pride itself. But it's nice to have a little a balance between the two sexes. <laughs> 